Here I am, I'll be back here at the Good floor. afternoon, everybody. Yeah. I know I don't look a little, even a little tiny bit like Jill Wagner, but she's on vacation, and I'm part of the marketing department. I'm Pat Coco, and I'm the outreach coordinator for the newest program here at the Arms called the Adult Daycare Program. We're up on the fifth floor, and if you don't know about us, after the show is over and you get your refreshments, if you'd like to take a tour, I'd be glad to take you up and show you our space. In the meantime, I want you to welcome the most wonderful troop of players possibly have this, this whole array of calendar things that we do every year. This is their, the end of their 11th season with us. It's really days that yesteryear players work so hard all year long and all the time that they're not, not here coming up with great scripts to present to you so that you can relive the radio. So please welcome them, thank them for their 11 years and look forward to 12 coming up. Finishing off our 11th season, and uh, we, when we started this 11 years ago, we had no idea it was going to last this long, and we're already like, hey, we have done this show, we have done this show, we can do this show, we can do that show. We're already planning a fantastic year, which we'll talk more about at the end of this. Uh, so today, however, we are we chose to do a show that was iconic in both uh, literature and film, uh, and of course, then when it appeared on the radio, it also took everybody by storm there. In 1930, an ex-detective in San Francisco rocked the, uh, the detective film noir novel world with a new style of gritty and what was to be later coined hard-boiled detective novels and short stories. Gone were the proper and dignified Ellery, Ellery Queen or Curlow days, long past were the intellectual Sherlock Holmes. Dashiell Hammett created characters that were flawed. He took us into the seedy underworld of San Francisco and showed us things that we had never seen before. The heroes weren't pure, and the villains were complex. The stories multi-layered and were intentionally misleading to the reader. Things were not always black and white and clear. Things were not as they seemed. Things got messy and out of control, and not everything was tied up in a nice and tidy bow at the end. Everything were shades of gray. And in the middle of that gray was a detective that had no name and was only referred to by all the readers and reviewers as the Continental Op. Until Sam Spade appeared. Here at last was a clearly defined character who had his own morals, his own code, which may or may not be aligned with the law. And he paved the way for many iconic detectives to follow, like Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe of that same era and the modern-day Spencer by the late Robert B. Parker, and many, many more. Now, while there was a film adaptation of the following year in 1931, it was the 1941 version that really grabbed everyone's attention, starring such iconic stars as Humphrey Bogart, Peter Lorre, and Sidney Greenstreet. They made these characters of Spade and Cairo and Gutman jump off the screen. Ironically, while this story appeared on the radio quite a few times, and with the original cast, for some reason, the Lux Radio Theater adaptation from February 8, 1943, exactly 70 years ago, did not feature any of the stars. <coughs> Suppose they were all busy at the time doing other fantastic movies and projects. So instead, you will see the role of Sam Spade being performed not by Humphrey Bogart, but by another iconic, hard-boiled crime actor. And we will perform this production for you just as it aired those many years ago, complete with sound effects, music, and more. And while you are listening, you might pretend that you are one of those who have the fortune of being in the live studio audience as they watch their favorite performers do their thing. Or, perhaps, you might wish to just sit back, close your eyes, and imagine that you are sitting in the living room in front of the old Philco radio, anxiously awaiting for your favorite show to begin. So now join us as we take you back to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Lux presents Hollywood. Patrick 
Leah Krigar in The Maltese Falcon. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some people like mystery stories because of the intellectual challenge they present. Personally, I am seldom able to figure out who done it without, uh, without skipping to the back of the book. But give me a good detective story and, like presidents, bankers, housewives, and chorus girls the country over, I find that my own troubles fold up their tents like the Arabs and steal silently away. Tonight, we point with pride to a triumph of the art, the Dashiell Hammond classic, The Maltese Falcon. Brought to us by three of our favorite stars, Edward G. Robinson, Gail Patrick, and Laird Krigar. The Warner Brothers screenplay was masterfully written and directed by John Houston, who comes by his talent naturally because he's Walter Houston's son. For the next hour, we'll follow the eerie trail of this fabulous falcon, which is coveted by many people, to their great ill fortune, and to the great ill health of a few. I think most of us have a secret desire to be detectives, at least that seems to be very true of this audience, because you've done some good practical detective work by discovering dozens of different ways to use Lux Flakes. <laughs> and that doesn't make any of us unhappy. Nowadays, many familiar materials are doing a wartime job. Nylon and silk are going to parachutes. Cotton, rayon, and wool into uniforms. And many other wartime uses. That means that we on the home front must make the things we have last longer so that our boys on the fighting front will have what they need. You're all trying to track down ways and means to make washable fabrics last. And the clue that's giving you domestic detectives the solution is Lux Flakes. But now let's track down the Maltese Falcon, because here's the first act. Starring Edward G. Robinson as Sam Spade, Gail Patrick as Bridget, and Larry Trigar as Gutman. <coughs> At 2 o'clock in the morning, the city of San Francisco lies sleeping under a blanket of fog. Along a lonely street, a man walks slowly. His footsteps ring the hollowly against the wet pavement. He passes a deserted alley and stops. The man turns and peers for a long time into the shadows. Suddenly, one of the shadows moves. The man stumbles backward. His hands reach out to shield his body. Ooh! Will you come in, Miss Thank you. Mr. Spade, 
stay? Yeah, that's right. What can I do for you, Miss Wonderly? Well, I, I don't know where to start. I asked at the hotel for the name of a reliable private detective, and they mentioned yours. I see. Well, now, suppose you tell me about it from the very beginning. Well, I'm from New York. I've come here to find my sister. Mm -hmm. Well, are you sure she's in New York? San Francisco? Well, she was two weeks ago. I have a letter from her. She came here with a man named Thursby. Floyd Thursby. You mean she ran away with her? Yes. Oh, Mr. Spade, I've got to find her. Mother and father are in Honolulu and it would kill them. I've got to get her back before they come home. Oh, what did she say in the letter? Nothing. Except that she was all right. I sent her a note begging her not to do anything foolish. I sent it to general delivery. I told her I was coming out to get her. I shouldn't have done that, should I? Well, it's not always easy to know what to do. You haven't found her? No. No, I, I told her I'd be at the St. Mark for her to meet me there. But I've waited three whole days. She didn't come. Didn't even send a message. Yeah, go on. Oh, it was horrible. Waiting. Yesterday afternoon, I went to the post office. Corinne didn't come for her mail, but Floyd Thursby uh, did. Did you speak to him? Yes. He wouldn't tell me where Corinne was, but he promised to bring her to the hotel this evening. Hi, Sam. Say, I... Oh, uh, excuse me. No, uh, it's all right. It's all right, Miles. Uh, oh, uh, Miss Wonderly, this is Mr. Archer, my partner. Well, uh, how do you do? Mr. Archer. Anything I can do, Sam? Well, uh, Miss Wonderly's sister ran away from New York with a fellow named Thursby. Mm -hmm. Miss Wonderly has seen Thursby and has a date with him tonight at the St. Mark. Maybe he'll bring the sister with him, but the chances are he won't. Miss Wonderly wants us to find the sister and get her away from him and back home, right? Yes, but I want you to know that he's a dangerous man. I don't think he'd stop at anything. I don't believe he'd hesitate to, to kill Kerwin if he thought it would save him. What time does he come to see you? Between 8 and 10. All right, Miss Wonderly. We'll have a man there. Oh, no, Sam, no. This is too important for that. I'll look after it myself, Miss Wonderly. Oh, thank you. Not at all. Oh, oh, here. I brought some money. Two hundred dollars would be enough. No, to begin with, yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, it would help if, if you meet Thursby in the lobby. Oh, I will. You don't have to look for me, Miss Wonderly. I'll see you all right. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Miss Wonderly. See you tonight. Yes, goodbye. Well, Miles, what do you think of her? You saw her first, Sam, but I spoke first. I wasn't talking about her figure. What about her story? Huh? Oh, what about her? Uh, you've got a great brain, Miles. Yes, you have. So Miles went up to tell Thursby last night. Yeah. And Thursby shot him. Is that what you think? No, that's what you think, Dundee. I don't know. Tom, get on the phone. Call the same market and ask for a girl named Wonderly. I thought of that myself, Lieutenant. She was never registered. The whole story's probably a fake. Oh, was it? How about yours, Mr. Spade? Uh, Tom, what's your boyfriend getting at? I'll tell you what I'm getting at. Floyd Thursby was shot down in front of his hotel an hour ago. Take your paws off me. Easy, boss. Don't rough him up. Where were you tonight, Spade? I was right here all night long. Got any proof? No. So you think I shot Thursby, huh? Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> Well, I know where I stand now. Did uh, Thursby die? Yes. How did I kill him? I forget. He was shot three times in the back with a 44. Hotel people know anything about him? Nothing, except he'd been there a week. Alone? Alone. Well, did you find out who he was? What his game was? Nope. We thought you could tell us that. I've never seen Thursby, dead or alive. Now look, Spade, if you did get Thursby, you'd get a square deal out of me and most of the breaks. Don't know that I'd blame you a lot, the man that killed your partner. But that wouldn't keep me from nailing you. Yeah, uh, fair enough. But I'd feel better about it if I uh, have, a, have a drink. Have a drink with me? No. Well, good night, gentlemen. I'm tired. Apartments? Oh. 101, no. I'll be there in a few minutes. 
Oh, by the way, what's your name this morning, Miss LeBlanc? Okay, Miss LeBlanc. Mr. Spade, I have a terrible confession to make. Yeah? Well, go ahead, Miss LeBlanc. Well, that, that story I told you yesterday was all a story. Oh, that's all right. I didn't believe your story anyhow. I believe your $200. Oh. Yeah, you paid too much for something that was telling the truth. <laughs> oh, I see. Now, uh, let's clear up one thing first, Miss LeBlanc. What? Your name. Now, what is it? Not LeBlanc. No, it, it's really Shaughnessy. First name? Bridget. Bridget Shaughnessy. Well, uh, that's one I can believe. Mr. Spade, tell me, am I to blame for last night? Well, you warned us in the 30s. It was dangerous. So we wouldn't say it was your fault. Oh, thank you. Mr. Archer was so, so alive yesterday, so solid no, and hard. stop it. He knew what he was doing. Those are the chances you take. Anyway, there's no time for worrying about that. Right now, there's a flock of cops running around with their noses to the ground. Mr. Spade, do they know about me? Well, so far, all they know is that there's a girl somewhere. But must they know about me at all, Mr. Spade? Could you manage to shield me from them? Well, maybe, but uh, I'll have to know what's it all about. Well, I can't tell you now. Later I will. You'll have to trust me. Oh, I'm so alone and afraid. I, I've got nobody to help me if you won't. Please trust me. Help me. Be generous, Mr. Spade. Mm -hmm. You don't need much of anybody, so you're good. It's chiefly your eyes, I think. And that throb you get in your voice when you say things like, Be generous, Mr. Spade. All right. I deserve that. But the lie was in the way I said it, not in what I said. You can leave if you no, like. No, 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 not yet. I've got nothing against trusting you blindly, but uh, I can't be any good if I don't know what it's all about. For instance, I've got to have some sort of line on your friend Thursby. I met him in Hong Kong. We came here just last week. Where? Not from Hong Kong? No. Where? Well, I... I can't tell you. Well, go on. I needed him. I was completely dependent on him. He knew it. He took advantage of it to jump across me. Come on. I can't tell you that either. <laughs> well, why'd you want him shattered? I wanted to learn how far he'd gone, whom he was meeting. Did he kill Archer? Yes, certainly. Well, our Thursby had a Luger in his shoulder. Also, Archer wasn't killed with a Luger. So I always carried an extra revolver in his overcoat pocket. Why all the guns? He lived by them. He picked a nice playmate. All right, let's have it now. How bad of a spot are you in? As bad as bad could be. Physical danger? <laughs> yes. And I'm not heroic. I don't think there's anything worse than death. Oh, shut up. You mean someone might kill you? Yes. And they'll get me unless you help. You've got to help, do you hear? You've got to! I uh, said shut up. All right, I'll help you. And they'll probably give it to me, too. Um, all right, so what? I guess I won't be the first guy that they make a sucker out of him. He's back again, Mr. Spade. Who, Effie? Uh, the fellow that was here this morning. Here's his card. Joel Cairo. What is he, a character? Mm-hmm. Foreign type. He smells like... Cardinia. Cardinia. Uh, well, uh, shoot him in, Effie. Right. Will you come in, Carl? You're very kind. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, sit down, Mr. Cairo. Thank you. I'm Sam Spade. Something I can do for you, Mr. Cairo? Yes, thank you. But first, may a stranger offer condolences for your partner's unfortunate death? Thank you. And may I ask, Mr. Spade, if there is a certain relationship between that and the death of the man Thursby? May I ask that? No. I beg your pardon. Mr. Spade, I am trying to recover an, an ornament that has been, shall we say, mislaid. I thought and hoped you could assist me. Yeah. The ornament is a statuette, a black figure of a bird. Yeah. And I prepared to make, on behalf of the figure's rightful owner, the sum, the sum of five thousand dollars for its recovery and the, what is the phrase? No questions will be asked. Well, five thousand dollars is a lot of money. Come in. Is there anything else for me, Mr. Spade? No, oh, no. Uh, good night, Effie. Uh, lock the door when you go, will you? Good night. Yes, Mr. Cairo, five thousand dollars is a fair... What do you think you're doing? I'm pointing a 
paper of water at a spot directly between your eyes. You please clasp your hands together at the back of your necks and do not move. I intend to search your office and if you attempt to prevent me, I shall certainly shoot you. Alright, go ahead. You will please stand. I shall make sure you are not armed. Certainly. Oh. <laughs> Alright, I will drop the gun. Please oh. drop it. Oh. Drop it. Or do I twist your arm off at the elbow? Oh. Here, take it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Now sit down over there and behave yourself. You... You have bruised me, Mr. Speed. Well, sorry. <laughs> I guess I got a little annoyed. I don't like guys who make a phony offer of $5,000. You are mistaken, Mr. Speed. That was and is a genuine offer. Yeah? And I am prepared to pay $5,000 for the figure's return. You have the figure? No. Then why did you risk serious injury to prevent my searching for it? Well, I should sit around and let people come in and stick me up. So the offer still goes, huh? Most certainly. Well, all right. Now, let's put the cards on the table. Your first guess was that I had the bird. Now there's nothing but that. Now, what's your second guess? That you know where it is, or at least that you know it is where you can get it. Well, you're not hiring me to do any murders or burglaries for you, but to simply get it back, if possible, and... Uh, Honest, lawful way? If possible. And in any event, with discretion. I'm at the Hotel Belvedere when you wish to communicate with me. Good evening, Mr. Spade. So long. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, you know a girl named Wonderly? No, I do not. LeBlanc? No. Well, how about Bridget Shaughnessy? The Hotel Belvedere, Mr. Spade. Room 6, Drive 5. Okay. Oh, by the way. May I have my revolver back, please? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I, I forgot it. Here, here you are. Thank you. Now, you would please keep your hands behind your head. I still intend to search your office. <laughs> well, I'll be... All right, go ahead. Thank you. Come in, Mr. Spade. Do you have any news for me? Yeah, a little. And did you manage it so that the police won't have to know about me? No, they won't. For a while, anyway. Oh. Well, you won't get into any trouble, will you, Mr. Spade? Oh, I don't mind a reasonable amount of trouble. Do sit down, please. Do sit down, please. Now look, you aren't exactly the sort of person you pretend to be, are you? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Oh, uh, schoolgirl manner, stammering, blushing, and all that. Because we are, honey, we'll never get any place. Now stop acting. All right. I'm sorry. Good. I saw Joel Cairo tonight. You... you know him? Only slightly. What did he say? About what? About me? Nothing. Well, what did he talk about? Well, he offered me $5,000 for the black bird. Oh, did he? And what did you say? Well, he said $5,000 is a lot of money. It is. It's a lot more than I could ever offer you if I must bid for your loyalty. <laughs> That's good. Coming from you. Now, what have you given me besides $200? Have you given me any of your confidence? Any of your trust? Can't you trust me a little longer? Well, how much is a little longer? What are you waiting for? Well, I, I, I must talk to Joel Cairo. Uh, you can see him tonight. He can't come here. I can't let him know where I am. I'm afraid. Well, my place then. What about it? All right. Your place. Yeah. But wait. You'll have to let me go about this in my own way. You mustn't interfere. Yeah, no, I'll just sit and listen while you talk over old times. <laughs> You're a strange person. I like you. Yeah? Well, don't overdo it. Sit down, Mr. Cairo. Sit down, Miss Shaughnessy. I might advise you, Mr. Spade. There's a boy outside who seems to be watching the house. Yes, I know. I spotted him. What boy? Who is he? Oh, uh, gunman, I guess. He's been tailing me around town all evening. Did he follow you to my apartment? No, I should be before that. Well, uh, let's start this meeting. I'm delighted to see you again, Miss Shaughnessy. I was sure you would be, Joel. Uh, sure. I'll mix a drink. <laughs> Just go ahead, Bridget. Mr. Spade told me about your offer for the Falcon. How soon can you have the money ready? It is ready. In cash? Oh, yes. You're ready to give us $5,000 if we turn over the falcon to you? I should be able to give you the money at, say, half past ten in the morning. But I haven't got the falcon. What? Well, don't worry. I'll have it in another week at the most. Why must I wait a week? Well, perhaps not a whole week. And why, if I may ask, are you willing to sell it to me at all? 
I'm afraid, after what happened to Floyd, I'm afraid to touch it except to turn it over to somebody else right away. Tell me, exactly what did happen to Floyd? He was murdered by the fat man. The fat man? Is he here? I don't know. I suppose so. What difference does it make? It might make a world of difference. Yes, you might be able to get around the fat man, Joel, as you did that one in Istanbul. What was his name? The one you did away with? It's a lie! You dirty little... Get away! Get here! Now, cool down. This... This is the second time you've put your hands on me, Mr. Spade! Well, I'll try and make it the last. Now, you better get out, Cairo. I'll call you tomorrow. You're working for her, though, is that it? I'm working for myself. If you want to withdraw your offer, just say so. The offer still stands. Uh, Get out. Very well. Good night, Mr. Speed. Well, you've got some fine friends, Miss Johnson. We always try to throttle you. I suppose I ought to thank you. Well, you've had your talk with Cairo. Now you can talk to me. Well, it didn't work out the way I hoped. I'll have to go now. Oh, no, no, no. Not until you've told me about it. Am I a prisoner? Maybe. Or maybe that kid outside hasn't gone home yet. Do you think he's still there? Likely. I'll stay. For a while, anyway. Okay. Now, uh, what's this bird, this falcon, that everyone's all steamed up about? It's a black figure of a bird, a, a hawk or a falcon, about a foot high. Uh, what makes it so important? I don't know. They wouldn't tell me, but they promised me $5,000 if I helped them get it from the man who had it. That was in Istanbul? Yes. Well, okay, go ahead. That's all. They promised to make me the money to help him, and I did. When we found out that Joel Cairo meant to desert us, taking the Falcon with him and leaving Floyd and me nothing, so we did exactly that to Mr. Cairo. Mm. And I wasn't any better off than before, because Floyd hadn't any intention of keeping his promise to me about sharing equally. I learned that by the time we got here. What's the bird made of? Porcelain or black stone. I, I don't know. You're a liar. What? A liar! Yes, I am. <laughs> I've always been a liar. Well, don't brag about it. Is there any truth in all of that yarn? Some. Not very much. All right. But we've got all night before us. I'll put on some coffee. We'll try again. Oh. Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of lying and thinking of lies and not knowing what is a lie and what's the truth. Don't ask me. Please don't. If you have any kindness in uh, your all. What are you trying now? That's right. Turn on the beauty. Let your eyes get starry and nice. Put your arms around my neck and look pleadingly at me. Ah, you're great. You think it's going to get you any place? Oh, I couldn't. With you. No? Well, don't be too sure. Uh -huh. We'll hear Act Two of The Maltese Falcon, starring Edward G. Robinson, Gail Patrick, and Laird Krieger in just a moment. Meantime. I have exciting news for you. The package of locks you have in your home now looks just like the package you've always bought, but the flakes inside have been improved so that they can help you more than ever to save washables in more time. Washables that may be irreplaceable. Remember, the locks your dealer has now in the same familiar package is new, improved locks. Improved three ways. The first way, it, Mrs. Burton, how would you like to have a lux that's even milder and safer than ever? Why, that would be wonderful. But it's hard to see how lux could be milder. <laughs> well, <laughs> new improved lux is the mildest, safest ever made. To give today's precious washables the super safe care they need to make them last longer. Now, uh, Mrs. Johnson, suppose I told you suds from new improved lux are even richer, more cleansing than before. Why, that's just what I need for the children's things. A soap that's really mild, but that really gets after the dirt. And uh, Mrs. Sutherland, how would you like a lux made with suds that are even longer lasting? Even longer lasting than before? Why, that would make lux thriftier than ever. Yes, new improved lux is better than ever for every soap and water job you do. First, it's the mildest, safest lux ever made. Second, its suds are richer, more cleansing. Third, 
They're longer lasting suds that do more work. Give more of your washables that super safe Lux care. Not only silks and woolens and rayons, but gay cottons, all your colored things. New, improved Lux comes in the same familiar box. Your dealer has it now. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Maltese Falcon, starring Edward G. Robinson as Sam Spade, Gail Patrick as Bridget, and Larry Krigar as Gunner. On the trail of the Black Falcon, Sam Spade has followed nothing but blind alleys. But now, a call comes from his secretary. He was here twice, Mr. Spade. He wouldn't leave his name, though. No place I could reach him? He said something about the Hotel Barclay. Look like I think. Can you describe him? Well, that was easy enough. A big fella. About 270 pounds. Yeah. The fat man. In the lobby of the Hotel Barclay, Sam Spade watches for the fat man, but he sees only the boy who has followed him for the last three days. All right, all right, son. Where is he? What? Come on, where is he? You work for him, don't you? Oh, the fat man. I want to speak to him. What do you think you're doing, Jack? You kidding me? I'll tell you what I am. You've been tailing around for, after me for three days. I'm getting a little sick of it. You can tell the fat man I said so. Shut off. You'll have to talk to me before you're through, Sonny. So will he. I said shut off. And you can't take that hand out of your pocket. Guns don't scare me much. Keep asking for it. You're going to get it. But a lengthy. People lose their teeth talking like that. If you want to hang around, be polite. Now, tell the fat man to call me and leave his name. Mr. Spade? Mr. Gutman called. He said the boy gave him the message. Room 407 at the Barclay this afternoon at 3. Ah, Mr. Spade, delighted to see you. Delighted. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Gutman? Sit down, my friend. We'll have a little drink. Yeah. Can't stay long. I'm sorry. I've got an appointment at the district attorney's office. Oh, interesting. Say when, Mr. Spade. Uh, I'll give that to you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I distrust the man who says when. And you've got to be careful not to drink too much, because it's not to be trusted when he does. You're a closed mouth man, Mr. Spade. No, no, I like to talk. I enjoy it. And better and better. I dispose, I distrust a closed mouth man. He generally picks the wrong time to talk and says all the wrong things. Well, you talk. That's well. We'll be talking about the blackbird. You're the man for me, sir. No beating about the bush, but right to the point. But first, sir, answer me a question. Are you here as Miss Shaughnessy's representative or Mr. Cairo's? Well, there's nothing certain about it either way yet. It depends. Which will you represent? Who will be one or the other? Not necessarily. Who else is there? Well, there's me. Oh, that's wonderful, sir. Wonderful. I do like a man who tells you right off that he's looking out for himself. Let's talk about the blackbird. Let's. Mr. Uh, Spade, have you any conception of how much money can be got for that blackbird? No. Well, if I told you the, if I told you half, sir, you'd call me a liar. No. Not even if I thought so. <laughs> you, you know, you know, of course, what the bird is, of course. No, I don't. You don't. They didn't tell you that. Well, I know what we're supposed to look like, and I know the value in human life that you people put on it. But Miss Shaughnessy didn't tell you what it is, and Cairo didn't either. Mm -hmm. They must know what it is. Or do they? What is your impression, sir? Well, there's much to go by. Cairo wouldn't talk. The girl said she didn't know, but I took it for granted she was lying. Then they don't know. I am the only one in this whole wide, wonderful world who does. No, no, that's great. When you told me, there'll be two of us. Mathematically <laughs> correct, sir. But I don't know for certain that I'm going to tell you. Now, don't be foolish. You know what it is. I know where it is. That's why I'm here. Well, sir, where is it? There, uh, you see? I must tell things, but you refuse. It is hardly equitable, sir. No, 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 no. I don't think we can do business along these lines. No, no, no. Well, think again and think fast. I told that gun of yours that you'd have to talk to me before you finish. Now, I tell you now that you'll do your talking today or you're through. Now, what are you waiting my, wasting my time for? I can get away without it, without you. Now talk, tell. Anything wrong, boss? Come in, Wilma. Oh, yeah, yeah, come in, Sonny. 
Keep your hands off your gun or I'll knock your ears down. Listen, you, I'm gonna take you out. <laughs> Wilma! Just stand over there, Wilma. <laughs> it's a good young man, Mr. Spade. Well, make up your mind, Captain. While you're doing it, keep that gunsel away from me, I'll kill him. <laughs> Mr. Spade, I must say you've a most violent temper. Uh, think it over. You've got until 5.30, then you're either in or out for keeps. We need your help. Now, who killed Floyd Thursby? I don't know. Perhaps you don't, but you can make an excellent guess. Well, my guess might be excellent, or it might be crummy. But Mrs. Spade didn't raise any children dippy enough to make guesses in front of a district attorney and a stenographer. Mr. Spade, I wish you wouldn't regard this as a formal inquiry. And please don't think I have any belief in those theories the police seem to have formed. You see, they think you killed Thursby. Yeah? Well, what's your theory? Simple. Tell me who Archie was shadowing Thursby for, and I'll tell you the murderer. <laughs> well, that's where you're wrong. Whether or not I'm wrong isn't for you to judge. I'm a sworn officer of the law, Mr. Spade. My I thought that. this was an informal talk. Well, it is. Well, then I... listen. The police think I'm mixed up in these killings. Well, my best chance of clearing myself is to bring the murderers all tied up. My only chance of ever tying them up is by keeping away from you and the cops. Because you're only going to gum up the works. Now, just a minute, I Mr. don't Spade. want any more of these informal talks. You want to come see me, pinch me, or subpoena me, or something. And I'll come down with my lawyer. See you at the inquest. Son, didn't expect to see you until 5.25. Hope I haven't kept you waiting. You just keep on riding me. They'll be picking an iron out of your living. <laughs> the cheaper the crook, the gunnier the pattern. Coming ready to talk? He's waiting at the hotel. You get going. We're on the way up now. Thank you. Oh, hello, operator. I don't want to receive any calls for about an hour. Thank you. Come on in and get in there, Sonny. Mr. Spade. Here, Captain. Here's your gunman's six-shooter. Oh. Well, what's this? I took it away from him. I was afraid he might hurt himself. <laughs> I'll get you, Spade. Someday I'll get you and I'll give you a happy uh, right now. Get out of here. Well, wait outside, Wilma. My God, sir, you're a chap worth knowing. Amazing character. Here, I'll fix you a drink. Ah, uh, thanks. Oh, by the way, I owe you an apology. Never mind. Never mind. Let's talk about the bird. All right, sir. Let's. Mr. Speed, this is going to be the most astounding thing you ever heard. Yeah? What do you know, sir, about the Knights of Rhodes? Nothing. Well, they were crusaders, Mr. Speed. In 1539, these crusading knights persuaded the Emperor, Charles V, to give them the island of Malta. Yeah. But he made one condition. They were to pay him each year the tribute of a falcon in acknowledgment that Walter was still under Spain. Do you follow me? Yeah, so far. Good. Well, sir, the knights were profoundly grateful to the emperor for his generosity toward them. Mm -hmm. For the very first year, they sent him not an insignificant live bird, but a glorious golden falcon, encrusted from head to foot with the finest jewels in their coffers. Well, sir, what do you think of that? I don't know. These are facts, historical facts. They sent this jewel bird to Charles, who was then in Spain, but it never reached Spain. It was that one of Buccaneers took the Knights Galley and the bird. Mm. 1713, it turned up in Sicily. In 1840, it appeared in Paris. Oh. It had, by that time, acquired a coat of black enamel, so that it looked like nothing more than a fairly interesting black statuette. And then, in 1922, a Greek leader named Chalios found it in an obscure shop. No thickness of enamel could conceal the value from his eyes. Uh, drink up, sir. Yeah, well, go on. Well, sir, to hold it safe, Charlios re-enameled re the bird. I see. I got wind of his find, but when I arrived in Athens, I discovered that the bird was gone. Charlios murdered. That was over 20 years ago. Well, sir, it took me 20 years to locate that bird, but I did. I traced it to the home of Russian general, one Karadov. In Istanbul, I sent some agents to get it. Well, sir, they got it. And I haven't got it. Where's Kamenov? Oh, Kamenov. He died. Very suddenly. Yes. His heart. Yes, was there a knife in it or a bullet? Your glass, sir. Thank you. And, and now, uh, uh, before we start to talk prices, how soon are you willing to produce the falcon? A couple of days. Oh, that's 
quite satisfactory. Well, sir, here's to a fair bargain. Drink up. Well, um, what's your idea of a fair bargain? Twenty-five thousand dollars. When you deliver the falcon to me, or another twenty-five thousand later on. Or I'll give you one quarter of what I realize on the falcon. That would amount to a vastly greater sum. Ah, uh, uh, much greater. Who knows? Shall I say one hundred thousand? That would be the minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what's, what's the maximum? What would you say to a quarter of a million? Ah, uh, I think. I think that Dinkus is, is worth a million? Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, it's a lot of dough. A lot? A million. Dough. Million. Uh, what, what's, what's the maximum? Master, Mr. Spade, what's the matter? Are you feeling ill? Uh, I feel, uh, what, what? What's in that drink? Oh, it's a drink. Oh, I drugged it. Yeah? You'll be unconscious shortly, Mr. Spade. You'd better lie down. I wouldn't want you to fall. <laughs> That's it. That's very, very, very good. That's, that's very... Oh, dear. Dear. Oh, uh, Joel! Joel, come in! Is he unconscious? Yes. <laughs> you know, he's a very interesting person, Joel. The kind of a man I enjoy dealing with. last far longer than just by doing one very easy thing, would you do it? Of course you would. Then, listen to this. Recent tests show how to cut down stocking runs over 50%. Yes, a famous laboratory, the United States Testing Company Incorporated, repeatedly washed radon stockings different ways, then tested them on an almost human machine, a sort of that strain stockings the way you do in actual wear. Here's what they found. Washing with new improved Lux cuts down runs over 50%. Yes, the Lux stockings tested in the machine didn't go into runs nearly as easily as stockings washed with a strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. They lasted ever so much longer. You see, new improved Lux saves elasticity, so stockings can take extra strain without breaking into runs so easily. And here's what girls find in actual experience. Why, I got over twice to wear from my Lux stockings. Lux cut my runs almost in half. That means a lot now stockings are so precious. Better stick to Lux and avoid those enemies of stockings, cake soap rubbing and strong soaps. Uh, one special hint about rayons. They need 24 to 48 hours drying time. Get new improved Lux tomorrow. It's in the same familiar box, and your dealer has it right now. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. One of tonight's stars from the Atlantic recently. We'll hear about it right after the play. Now, the third act of The Maltese Falcon, starring Edward G. Robinson, Gail Patrick, and Laird Kriegar. When Sam Spade woke up, he was alone in the hotel room, pale and still shaking from the effects of the drug. He's gone to his office where Effie stares at him in alarm. Mr. Spade, what happened to you? Uh, I wouldn't know. I went visiting this afternoon with knockout drops. Came to just a little while ago, all spread out on man's floor. Who did it? The fat man. But why? Didn't have a chance to ask. Evidently, he wanted to get me out of the way or something. 
but I don't get it. You, hello, hello, yes, yes, what? Uh, I can't hear you. Who is it? Uh, give it to me again. Uh, yes, I've got that. Captain who? Jacoby? <laughs> yes, I, hello, hello. She's gone. Who's gone? Who? It was the Sean Fibros. She wants you. Here's the address. 26 Ancho Street. She's in some kind of trouble, Mr. Spain. She was telling me something about a captain, a, a ship captain named Jacoby, and then, and then, then something happened to her. What happened? I don't know, like, like she was being choked. Listen, is that the outside door? I'll see. Yes, what do you... Oh! Mr. Spade. Who is it, Effie? I don't know, it's... Mr. Spade? Yes. This package, for you. She told me, for you. What's the matter with you? For you. Oh! Um. Mr. Spade! Mr. Spade! Shut up. Lock the door. Yes. Here. Uh, give me that scissors from the desk, will ya? I want to see what's in this package. Here. Here. Is he? Is he dead? He's got about four slugs in him, that's all. Oh. Come on, put yourself together. I'm all right. Well, now, let's see. This is what I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? You've got it, Angel. We've got it. It's the Maltese okay. Falcon. The Falcon? Look at it. Big bird, black bird, mil million bucks under a coat of enamel. She said there was a... That's what she tried to tell us. He must be Captain Jacoby. Now listen, I've got to get to her. As soon as I've gone, phone the police. Tell them what happened, but forget he brought a bundle. Here, get it straight now. Yes. I'll leave the bird in the safe. When I call you, bring it to that Angel Street address. Got it? Yeah. And after you bring it to me, go out and call Dundee. Tell him to come on the run with about six cops. No mistakes, Heavy. I may need him. Just keep your hands up, Mr. Spade. Come in. Wilma, shut the door. Well, sir, we're all here, waiting for you. Now, let's sit down, Mr. Spade. Be comfortable. Sure. Sam, I tried to call you. I wanted to tell you... Oh, that's all right, honey. Take it easy. But they've been holding me here all last night and today. To go hard, Miss Shaughnessy. Yes, hello, Mr. Spade. I believe you know Mr. Cairo. Yeah. How do you do? <laughs> and Wilmer, of course. You carry a rod, you want to see? Yeah, get away. You're not going to frisk me. I don't understand. Well, sir. you're following me, and I'm going to make you use that gun. Ask your boss if he wants to be shot up before we talk. Sit down, Wilmer. <laughs> Mr. Spade, you're certainly a most headstrong individual. Uh, well, uh, uh, let's talk. Yeah. Are you ready to make the first payment and take the falcon off my hands? You're sure you haven't? Sam, have you? I didn't this afternoon, but now I have. And I'm willing to pay. Joel, the money, please. Uh, wait. There's another thing we have to be taken care of first. We've got to have a fall guy. I beg your pardon. Well, the police have got to have a victim, somebody they can stick these three murders to. Two. Only two murders, Mr. Spade. Those we undoubtedly killed your partner. All right, two. The point is, we've got to come through with somebody. The victim. When the time comes, if I don't, I'll be it. And whom do you recommend as this victim? No, well, I'm not fussy. How about giving them Wilmer here? He'll do. Hey, why you? Get away, punk. <laughs> I can't, Mr. Spade. You are the character. Well, it's our best bet. If we turn him over, the cops will be happy. We'll be free as the air. Well, what do you think of this, Wilmer? Mighty funny, hmm? Yeah, mighty funny. Well, anyway, he killed Thursby, didn't he? He's made to order for the pie. All right, get up on your feet. Go away, punk. I've taken all the riding from you I'm going to take. Get up and shoot it out. Calm yourself, Wilma. Mr. Spade, your plan is not at all practical. Let's not say anything more about it. Well, all right. I've got another suggestion on here. Most assuredly. Well, give them Joel Cairo. Suppose we give them you, Mr. Spade, or Miss Shaughnessy. How about that? Now, look. You people want the Falcon. I've got it, and the Fall Guy's part of the price. As for Miss Shaughnessy, well, if you think she can be read for the part, I'm perfectly willing to discuss it with you. Sam! What's the matter? You don't mean it. You couldn't. No, because I don't think the cops will be happy with that, Angel. Well, personally, I see only one guy who's really right, and that's Wilbur. I'll kill him. I'm gonna kill him. Stop it! Stop it! Do you hear? Oh, no, let him go. I told him to lay off me. I warned him. I hated to do that, but the punk had it coming. There's your fall guy, Mr. Governor. What do you say? I 
don't like it, sir. Well, either you'll say yes right now, or I'll turn the Falcon and the whole lot of you in. Well, all right. You can have Wilma. Carry him inside, Joel. My um, secretary left an hour ago with the phone. She ought to be here in a few minutes. What about the money, Edmund? In a few minutes, when she gets here, we'll get enough. Now, uh, let's get the details fixed. Now, why did Wilmer kill Thursby, and why and where did he shoot Captain Jacoby? Well, I shall be candid with you, sir. Thursby was Miss Shaughnessy's ally. We believe that disposing of him would frighten Miss Shaughnessy into patching up her differences with us. Hmm, that sounds all right. Now, Jacoby? Captain Jacoby's death was entirely Miss Shaughnessy's fault. That's a lie. Well, tell me what happened. Well, Cairo saw in the newspaper that Jacoby's ship was arriving. Do you remember that Jacoby and Miss Shaughnessy had been seen together in Hong Kong? Well, sir, he put two and two together and guessed the truth. She had given the bird to Jacoby to bring here. Uh, yeah, said at that juncture, you decided to slip your Mickey, huh? Well, I'm sorry. There was no place for you in our plans, Mr. Spade. Cairo and Wilmer and I went to the boat to call on Captain Jacoby and Miss Shaughnessy, who persuaded Miss Shaughnessy to come to terms, or so we thought. Well, sir, we mere men should have known better. En route to my hotel, Captain Jacoby and the Falcon slipped completely through our fingers, except that Wilmer put a few bullets in him while he was running away. By the way, you said Jacoby died. Yes, but uh, not until after he brought me the Falcon. Ah, well, there's a bright side to everything, isn't there? Not yet. It's my secretary. If you don't mind, I will go to the door with you. All right. Come on. Uh, Mr. Spade? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Effie. I, I wrapped it up again. Is there anything else? No, no, thanks, Effie. Uh, bye, Effie. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Spade. Let me have it, Mr. Spade. Now, easy, easy. Let me see it quickly. Here. <laughs> I guess the pleasure ought to be Mr. Gut. After 20 years. 20 years! Yes! There it is! There you are, Pluty! Is it? Is it the Vulcan? The original? We will make sure. Your knife, Joel. Yeah. Thank you. Just a tiny cut in the enamel, and underneath we find... Oh! Captain, what's the matter? It's a fake! It's lead! It's a fake! But it can be! All right, Sean, I see you had your little joke. Now tell us all about it. But no, Sam, no! That's the one I got from Kemenov, I swear! You bungled it, Cutman! You and your stupid attempt to buy it! Kemenov caught on how valuable it was. He put a fake in its place! Yes, that is Kemenov's hand. There's no doubt of it. Well, Joel, what do you suggest? Shall we stand here and shed tears and call each other names? Or shall we go to Istanbul? Istanbul? You, you're still going to look for the Falcon? For 20 years I've wanted that little item. We've been trying to get it. I'll go on trying. Very well. I'll, I'll go with you. Get Wilmer. We'll stop tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Wilmer, what? He's gone! What? The window is open. He's gone! Ah, swell out of feet. We have little enough to boast about, sir. But the world hasn't come to an end just because we run into a little setback. I'm sorry about your money, Mr. Spade, but of course you did not earn it. Well, I held up my end. You got your falcon. Your hard luck, not mine, but it wasn't what you wanted. My hat, Joe. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mr. Spade, it will do, do no good to argue. I have the money with me anyhow. Uh, I had an idea that was it. Now, sir, I will say goodbye to you. And since the shortest of farewells are the best, adieu. And to you, Miss Shaughnessy, I leave the Red Falcon as a little memento. Adieu. Sam, Sam, what are you going to do? Nothing. But those murders, you're mixed up in them. You said yourself the police needed a victim. Call them now. Tell them about Gutman. I don't have to call him. Gutman will be nailed before he goes up live. But when he's nailed, he'll talk about you. Now, we're sitting on dynamite, and we've only got a couple of minutes to get all set for the cops. Now, give me all that fast talk. Where shall I begin? Well, the day you first came to my office. Why did you want Thursby Shadow? I told you, Sam. I suspected him of betraying me, and I wanted to find out. Now, that's a lie. You had Thursby hooked, and you knew it. You wanted to get him out of the way before Jacoby came with the bird. Isn't that so? Yes. Well, what was your scheme? 
Well, I thought that if he saw someone following him, he might be frightened into going away. Well, then you must have told Thursby that Archer was following him. Yes, I told him. But please believe me, Sam, I wouldn't have told him if I thought Thursby would kill him. Well, if you thought he wouldn't kill Archer, you were right, Angel. He didn't? No. Archer's been a cop too long to be caught like that up a blind alley with his gun tucked away on his hip and his overcoat buttoned. But he would have gone up there with you, Angel. He was just dumb enough for that. Sam! And then, you could have stood as close to him as you liked in the dark and put a hole through him with a gun you'd gotten from Thursby that night. Don't! Don't talk to me like that, Sam! You know I didn't... No, shut up. This isn't the spot for this good old girl to act. Why did you shoot him? Oh, I didn't mean to at first. I didn't, really, but when I saw that Thursby couldn't be frightened, I... Oh, Sam, darling! Go on, go on. When you found that Thursby didn't mean to tackle Archie, you borrowed that gun and did it yourself, right? Yes. You didn't know that then that Gutman was hunt here hunting you. And then, yeah, and Thursby had been shot, and you knew you had to find another protector, so you came back to me. Yes, but, but Sam, it wasn't only that. I would have come back to you sooner or later. From the very first minute I saw you, I knew oh, that I... Oh, you angel. Well, if you get a good break, you'll be out of San Quentin in 20 years. Uh, you can come back to me then. What? Oh, no. Uh, You're not I'm going to... I'm going to send you over. Oh, no. Don't, Sam. Don't say that. They're taking the fall, darling. <laughs> You're doing this to me? Don't you understand, Sam? I'm in love with you. <laughs> That's great. But you can. You can. Yes, I can. You killed a man, darling. You know, deep down in your heart, you know that in spite of anything I've done, I love you. I don't care who loves who. I'm not going to play the sucker. I won't walk in Thursby's and I don't know how many other footsteps. You killed Miles, you're going over for it. Sam! That's the cops. Don't let them in, please. Sit tight, Tommy. Sam! Hello, Spade. Come in. You got the fat boy? Yeah, we got him. The kid, too. No, swell. Here's another one for you. She killed Miles. Can you prove it? Can I, Miss Shaughnessy? Can I prove it? Go on, tell him. Yes. All right. Come on. So long, Miss Shaughnessy. This, this doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Maybe. But you're going away. The chances are you'll get off for 20 years. If you do, I'll wait for you. If they hang you, Angel, I'll always remember you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We hope that you've enjoyed our show today. And uh, we're on a little mystery. And if you happen to see a black bird floating around, please let us know we misplaced it. But I'm sorry. Uh, so thank you so much. We've now completed our 11th season, and we are already deep into planning our upcoming 12th season, which will begin Sunday, September 8th. So be sure to mark your calendars. We've got an exciting show lined up. It's the big show with your host, Tallulah Bankhead. Also featuring special guest stars, Groucho Marx, Fanny Bryce and Andy Stafford as Baby Snooks and Daddy, and the lovely and sweet Jane Powell and that rich and delicious opera, Italian singer, uh, Italian opera singer, Ezio Pinzo. It'll be a great time for all of us as we start off our big 12th season Sunday, September 8th at 2 o'clock right here at the Oak Park Arms with The Big Show. And that's just the beginning. We have a rich season featuring a very spooky Halloween show with two episodes of The Weird Circle, a uh, Christmas during wartime special with episodes of Let's Pretend and Cavalcade of America, and the best of, or uh, perhaps the worst of, the Jack Benny and Fred Allen feud, as well as episodes of Gunsmoke, Dragnet, and Suspense, all coming up in this exciting 2013-14 uh, season. So be sure to check out our website at ttdyradio.com. That's ttdy for those thrilling days of yesteryear. Com for the latest updates and show information. And now, the cast of those thrilling days of yesteryear. The announcer and poll hoss, John Corona. <laughs> Playing CB and the DA, Lars Timpa. <laughs> Covering the role of Sam Spade was Don Gingle. Police Officer Dundee, John Gould. And playing Effie as well as the luck.
Lux, Mrs. Burton, and the Lux girl, Amy Kennedy. Playing Bridget O'Shaughnessy, uh, which, if that is in fact her real name, as well as the Lux Mrs. Johnson and Vim's Betty, Teresa Rinaldo. <laughs> Sam's partner, Archer, as well as the uh, man on the street, Jamie Sandoval. <laughs> Joel Cairo was played by Rob Rinaldo. Sutherland, as well as the woman and the young lady on the street, Pam Turbo. <laughs> Tough guy Wilmer, as the, and also the Vince announcer, Marty Dean. <laughs> and the elegant and sophisticated Gutman, the fat man, Rob Wall. would be complete without the synchronous sound of the stylings of Pam Turlo. <laughs> With special feature of Rob Malone and Rob Adalda as The Fight. <laughs> and I'm your producer and director, Ben Dooley. <laughs>